Hi everybody, my name is Antoinette, this is Good Owl Games and welcome to October's Monthly Roundup, the video where I tell you about, well, what I've been up to with my board game collection. So it's officially November now, which means all of you Christmas fanatics can finally come out from waiting in the wings and unleash Mariah Carey upon us without scrutiny. Um, yeah, um, our last month went really, really quickly. Um, and I hope you guys have been playing plenty of games. Um, for those of you new to this kind of format, um, what I do here is I'll first talk about the new games I've got in my collection. Then I'll talk about the games I've been playing over the past month. And then the last section is kind of a, a personally chit chat bit, which Ming with stuff about the channel and stuff about my life. Maybe you like hearing that, I don't know. Um, but I've put all those sections in, in the video so you can click around as appropriate. You don't have to watch the whole thing, although of course I would love if you did. And, and spoiler alert, this should be a short video. Um, did you know that depression and playing board games don't necessarily mix well together? Um, so yeah, things have been rough the past month or two and it's just been hard to look at a board game. Um, so yeah, I'm working on that. It's coming out the other side hopefully but it does mean that this video is woefully underprepared um, but I'll do my best to show you what I've got and hopefully um, it'll still be entertaining. So the first new game I got this month is one that I have been waiting for for ages because um, I was waiting for another print run and this is Beyond the Sun from Rio Grande Games. And I've talked about it here before. Um, and it was one of those things I've been watching out for. And it was a game as well that, that's kind of expensive for how it looks. So I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of it, but it's basically um, a game of tech trees, you know, where you learn science and things like that in a tree format. Um, but the game has little to no art. Um, it's like a, I don't know, some kind of nightmare. Um, and so I was very reluctant to pay a lot of money for a game that didn't seem to have put a lot of effort into it. Does that make sense? It does come with recess boards, but they're kind of very thin ones. It's like somebody went, oh, we've got recess boards. We don't need to do any more exciting stuff. That should draw in all of the gamers. Um, but I've wanted this for ages and it was pricey. And that's the thing. It didn't It didn't necessarily look like it was worth the price. Um, and that's a really hard thing for me to say as somebody who kind of, who wants to support people making board games, right? Um, I want to support publishers and designers. Um, and of course, everyone deserves to be paid for the work they do on a board game. And oftentimes I don't understand board game prices because I'm like, how did you put so much labor and effort and love and components into this and it only cost me, you know, 40 euros for a game I could I could technically play forever. Um, so there's that terrible divide there between deciding between one and the other, but I thought this game seemed overpriced. Um, I'm very fortunate. My husband is a bargain hunter and managed to find a cheaper copy in the States and it was cheaper to ship it um, and pay the taxes on it than to buy it in Europe, which is really, really sad. Um, but it does mean I've got a copy of Beyond the Sun. Hurrah! <laughs> I really want to try this for ages because um, everything about this game kind of appeals to me. Um, I am the queen of dry euros. I'm very happy um, to just, you know, move things about, solve puzzles. I can, I can live without art and things like that, assuming that the game itself is worthwhile playing. Um, and so you open up Beyond the Sun and it is just, yeah, this, this board of tech trees. And what it is, is that you as the players are kind of colonizing into space. And there's two real ways to do this. One is through advancing your technologies and learning new things. And the other is through conquering kind of planets and inhabiting, you know, space worlds and such. Um, there's a couple of things I really, really like about the game as a whole. Actually, a lot of things I really like. I was kind of hoping I would like it less, but no, it's actually really, really fun to play. Um, so the initial thing is you have your player board with lots of pieces on it and you remove pieces from it to use things and they allow you to unlock things later. So there are resources you're going to need. You always need people apparently in space um, and that kind of idea. So you, as you progress along, you're taking things off of your board so you can you know, have more resources. The tech tree, I think, is the, the most interesting part because it, it's this branching thing. So it starts out with there are kind of four routes you can go and you go all the way to like level four technology at the end and see how cool they are. The fun part is you don't know what the technologies are on your way there, right? So you're going through like four rows, let's say, of tech. Um, and when you get to them, they're upside down and you flip 
them up and it's an event that kind of can affect everybody or nobody and then you get to choose a selection of two um, that kind of match the path you're going on the right colors um, to decide which one you want to have out on the board but then other people can use them as well um, there's something really pleasant about working your way through the tech tree um, that I just I, I liked a lot and I knew I would um, you know looking at this game originally I'm like that's exactly what I like to do um, and how you win is through different goals. Um, I love when games do that and they're like, here's the four things you need to do to win. And the first person to put out so many discs, you know, on these rewards will end the game. Um, so yeah, it's fairly simple. It's easy to follow. There is quite a bit of text on the cards because there's, well, there's no art. Um, but otherwise I really, really enjoyed it. And I got to show it to a friend of ours and he really enjoyed it too. Um, so yeah, somehow despite itself, um, it's a really fun game to play. So um, I'm delighted now that I managed to pick it up. Um, would see what I recommend it to everybody? Probably not. I think you have to be able to overcome some of those initial boundaries. Because um, we live in a world where games like Wingspan and Everdell exist, um, where you can have all of the art and all of the gameplay at the same time. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a shame for this one, but um, I'm still rooting for it. I, I still think this is a crackingly good game. So that's beyond this one. Yay! I know some of you here have played it and we're enjoying it as well. So um, tell me, does it still feel good after later plays? We'll, we'll find out. So the second game I bought this month came entirely upon the recommendations of you, the people. Um, I asked, you know, what you thought I should play and I realised I really should update my board game geek account. It's really out of date with all the games I currently own. Um, but you all suggested the search for Planet X and I'd heard of it, kind of, but not really. I knew it was supposed to be like Cryptid, which is another deduction game. Um, and I really, really enjoy Cryptid, but it kind of, it kind of needs more than two players. It's not really good at two. Um, and what you folks told me was that, you know, the Search for Planet X would be good with two players. So you can be thankful that basically um, I'm still going for hikes at the weekend, which means I pass our board game shop. <laughs> so we stop once a week to go in and see if they got anything new. And sure enough, there you are, the Search for Planet X. So we picked that up and brought it home. Um, this one is really, really interesting. I am amazed more people aren't talking about it. So I'm here to tell you. Um, so the Search for Planet X is a game in which you play as astronomers and you are searching the night sky. Like imagine you're looking up into the sky in different quadrants um, to find this elusive Planet X. Um, and how this works is you need an app. And um, I don't know how people feel about apps um, when it comes to board games. I like them as long as they're doing something useful and they are not the entire game, that you don't have to spend your entire time on your phone. Um, I liked it in this case because of the type of puzzle it is. Um, and what you're doing on your turn is you start the game by getting a number of clues about where the planet might be. And these are all termed in terms of other objects in the sky, right? So you, you get given like a, a roll and write piece of paper with your map of the sky and it's got like all of the different types of things that could be in each quadrant there. And it's up to you to basically use the clues to cross off, you know, where things are or where they could not be until you can deduce um, where the planet is. It felt very like Sudoku to me. Uh, very much like, well, I know the nine can't be in this row, so it must be further down over here. It had that vibe to me. Um, the coolest part about this game, and I was really impressed by this, is that Yes, you use the app to play it, but you could choose your own difficulty and everyone could choose their own difficulty. So my husband chose a much more difficult level than I did. So I started with more clues than him. Um, and I thought that was a really nice touch as a way to kind of level out the playing field a bit and to make it kind of more fun. I got more information at the start. Um, so part of the game as well is you can, as the, see this is the thing right, the night sky changes of course as it goes round um, through kind of the seasons and stuff. So you're only able to search in certain quadrants of the sky as the sky moves around. But as it moves you're able to make guesses about where you think certain things are. Um, and they're worth victory points kind of at the end of the game. But also it's a very interesting way of picking up clues from other players. This is really the only interactive bit in the game. The rest of it is kind of your own solo affair. So you could say, I think there's a meteorite in this sector here. And then if it turns out to be true, well, then everyone else will get that information. If it turns out to be false, well, everyone else gets that information too. So we had a quite a lot of back and forth. Um, and when you search the sky, you announce which 
area you're looking in or what way you're going to look in it. So you can also kind of get hints from that about what your opponent might be thinking or where they think is worth looking. Um, oh, it hurt my head a lot, but I, I really, really liked it. And every time you, you know, you want to do a particular type of search, you use the app um, and it'll give you, you know, your answer or things like that so you can keep it private. Um, and I had so much fun with this. I can't believe I won. That was the weird bit. I'm not good at working stuff out, but there was much crossing. Um, you do have to watch for human error. Ah, oh, the amount of times I'm like, I thought that said that wasn't there, but it totally was. Um, and it seems like it's got a good bit of variety to it as well, um, because each game kind of seemed to have its own unique kind of setup and stuff like that. Um, but overall, really, really enjoyed it. I spent the day after playing it thinking about it again, about wanting to go back to it. Um, I do believe it has a solo mode, and I think this could be really fun solo as well, as in I, I might consider playing it solo while you're just kind of trying to deduce the answers. Um, but I'm very impressed with it overall. Um, really, really fun game. And I think if you like those kind of puzzles, um, this is outstanding. So yeah, if you're into that stuff, then that's cool. So I guess the, the only question I've left to ask now, because that was all of my new games, um, is what new games have you got and what have you been playing? Is there anything particularly exciting um, we should know about? Especially it's coming up to Christmas. Now is the time when people might buy a few board games. So if you've got any recommendations, I would definitely be interested in those. Um, but yeah, definitely. I want to hear what's, what's, yeah, what's happening in your board game collection. Right, so we're gonna move on to the second section now, which is games I've been playing. But if you've been listening to the first section, that's pretty much the games I've been playing. So board games I've played this month has definitely been thin on the ground. Like, I'm pretty sure that up until yesterday, I'd only played one game of Batman and one game of Azul. <laughs> so yeah, this is gonna be um, mostly empty. But um, I will talk to you about something that's kind of unique for me to do. And so this is, um, I have a friend who comes to play board games every so often with myself and my husband. Hi, Brian. And basically he brings the same game with him every time to play. And this game is Pax Premier. Um, and I've talked about it here before. Um, I, I really like Pax Premier. It's this really, oh, I don't know, how am I gonna put this? Like. If you describe this game, it sounds awful, but you have to play it to really see how smart it is. But mostly it's a game about shifting allegiances and trying to have majorities so that you can be the victor. It, it does this through purchasing cards and you'll have a tableau of people in play with abilities, but mostly it's about putting those beautiful little square things out on the map to say you own them and putting cylinders out to say you have influence, okay? Um, and this is all kind of, but, well, the interesting part of all of this is the fact that you can switch allegiances um, basically whenever you want. So it can look like when well, this happened in our last game where I was the British and basically um, I just kept putting out cylinders and putting out blocks and then everyone just turned British and then all of my pieces became their pieces because they're, they're shared like that because if you're loyal to the British now we're all loyal to the British and it also meant we couldn't attack each other or anything exciting like that and they were trying to piggyback off my victory um and so Pax Premier is just this really really interesting puzzle and I feel like I learned something new about it every time I play or a new idea or something I haven't quite fully grasped yet um, but what's, but apart from the game being rather good and interesting what's really fascinating about this one to me is the fact that when I play board games, I hop around a lot. Um, the only thing I will play repeated plays of back to back are A, something that's absolutely outstandingly good, or B, something I'm reviewing. So this is where it gets interesting because I don't own this game. Um, I kind of wish I, I did, but I think it would be terrible just with two players. So my friend just gets to own it. But I've never played so many game, like so many games back to back of the same game. Now I know they're spread out a week or so apart, but every time it comes around, we play Pax Premier. That's how we end the evening. Um, and this is, yeah, this is a strange idea for me that, oh, we're, we're playing this again. And I'm kind of, developing strategies as we play it. Like I've gotten to the point now where I'm absolutely convinced that everyone else does well only because I don't do anything. So what I usually do is I focus on what I'm doing. So I'm like, okay, I'm the British. I'm going to be the best 
Brits ever. I will have all the Brit cards, I'll put out all the Brit tokens, I'll do all those things. And then everyone just comes in and uses it to their own advantage at a later date. I'm like, if I built a crappier kind of allegiance system, maybe this would be a very different game. And I find it interesting that that single thing that I do really influenced how everyone else plays. Now, I did win the last day, which was nice to see. Um, but it's just, it's funny, isn't it? I, I want to know, does anybody else, I suppose, play games back to back like that? Do you just play the same game repeatedly for a while till you get a real feel for it? Sometimes I wonder if I'm missing out by not doing that so much, but I, I don't know, I have a scattered brain. I'm like, oh, I feel like this today. Oh, I want to try this tomorrow. Um, you know, would I be a better player if I pay, played like, you know, 10 games of, I don't know, Terra Mystica back to back? Um, I might. Like, the other real interesting example I suppose I have of this is the side expansion, the Rise of Fenris one. I don't know if anyone's played that, but it's a, it's a campaign of like 10 games and as you play and you play the same faction each time, things are revealed and there are new things added to play with. And by playing that expansion, that's the first time I played that many games of side back to back, felt like I really learnt a lot about the game. Um, and I felt like I, yeah, yet again, I developed a strategy where I just developed all of my workers initially in the one place. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't have learned that without doing that. So I wonder, you know, am I, am I missing out by not playing games like that? Um, I'd love to know if you do. Is there anybody out there that does? You'll play the same game on repeat. I'd, I'd like to know your insights. Um, I might think about it again in future, but PAX is one of those games that really captures my imagination because I, I still feel like I'm, I'm working it out. Um, but it's, it's always a blast to play. But it's so weird playing so much of a game I don't even own. Feel like I'm a bit of a traitor. Maybe I should own it. I don't know. But yeah, so that, that is Pax Premier. I continue to tout its greatness um, despite its its theme, which is done kind of well, I suppose. You know, it's like all these Afghans trying to have different loyalties with different countries who are interested in them at the time. Um, but yeah, it's good stuff while we're checking out. So the second and final game I'm going to talk about is actually a really nice segue into my final section and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and this is Bullet Heart, or the Bullet Love, Bullet Heart, uh, that's what I call it. Um, and this is a, oh, this is such a fun game. If you've ever played any arcade games like Tetris or maybe Columns or Bejeweled or something like that, this is really the core of what this game is about. Um, you play as a particular character with special abilities and these bullets drop down into um, down into your site and you need to clear them away by grouping them together in different patterns and if they get to the bottom you get shot and you only have so many hit points. Um, there are a couple of different ways to play this game. You can play one versus one where you um, any bullets you clear you can send to your opponent. I hate that. You can also play cooperatively and take on a boss together where you send your bullets to the boss which I thought was quite cool as well. Um, and overall, this is just a really fun and interesting game. And I've had, I've, I've had it for quite a bit, but there's something about it that just, something in my brain just enjoys these kind of puzzles. So when I had a friend of mine come visit me at the weekend, for the first time in absolutely ages, and she wanted to play some board games, this is the first game I took out. And it gave me a little bit more insight into it, actually, um, which, which I'm going to share with you. Um, and I guess this is, so in the game you can choose a character. Um, the characters are all ladies and each one of them has a distinct way that their deck of cards plays or their abilities work, right? So they're all slightly different. And it was, while it was easy enough to explain how to play the game, get, understanding how those characters work is difficult. Now they are ranked by difficulty but getting your head, wrapping your head kind of around that as a new player seemed to be a bit of a challenge. Like you did want to play multiple plays um, with the characters to really you know get a hold of them because they are very different um, and each one does play uniquely. Um, so that was kind of interesting. I do love the game as well has a soundtrack um, because if you play one versus one you're supposed to have three minutes to place out all of your bullets and you know do all your 
your matching things and clear them off. And so yeah, there's a soundtrack that lasts three minutes. Um, there's a playlist for it on Spotify. And we had so much fun. The playlist is great. It really makes you feel like you're in a video game and you're like, you're trying to get everything out as fast as possible. So I think that really adds to it. And I think that's a, a really nice touch to add to a game. I, I love stuff that comes with a soundtrack. I think that just adds to the atmosphere and the levels of excitement. Um, so the good news is anyway, she enjoyed the game with me. We found it kind of, we found it um, hard. And I think some of that is to do with the timer. Although you can play it without one. Um, but we had a good time playing it together. It was just, yeah, it just hit the right note. So I I think Bullet um, Heart is actually, is super fun. Um, I will recommend though, if you are getting it to get the deluxe tokens, um, because deluxe tokens are kind of thick pieces of, of wood to have as your bullets. And so they're much more satisfying to click down. If you don't get that, you just get cardboard pieces, um, which I definitely think will lose some of the appeal of the game in kind of the way if you played Azul and it wasn't those nice tiles and it was just cardboard pieces. Yeah, it's that kind of comparison. So it's one of the few times where I'll say getting a deluxe version of anything is worth it. Um, but I think it is in this case. But yeah, Bullet is just such a fun game. Um, can recommend. Um, has anybody tried it or what do you make of it? Um, I also have played it solo. Ha! Which is weird, isn't it? I, I, I felt like I was like, I just want to do this at my own pace, in my own time, taking my time, making the best plays I could. Um, and that's kind of fun too. There's something very hypnotic about it going match the thing, match the thing, roll them up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's Bullet Heart. Um, and so um, that's pretty much everything I played this month. You're just going to have to bear with me on that. Hopefully we'll have some more things played next month. Um, so yeah, that's the fun bit. All right, so I'm going to jump into the personal bit and I have a good segue actually from Bullet or if you want to follow me over to the end bit where I want to talk about actually how to teach a board game because um, that's something that came up for me. Um, yeah, and I'll discuss that over there along with some other chit chatty stuff. All right, so section the third, and I'm gonna jump right into what, what I said before, um, because, um, you know, I had a, a guest at the weekend, and for the first time in a while, I had to teach a board game. Like, I'm very fortunate that my husband is the one who reads the rules in our house and teaches the games. Um, thank goodness for that. Um, I could do it, um, but I would be much slower about it. Um, I also think I would be much more careful, maybe it's slightly more accurate, but that's, that's just how we do things around here. So for the first time in ages, I had to show somebody else a board game. Um, and I thought I'd tell you about my thought process in this. Um, because, you know, I think one of the big parts of board games is teaching other people how to play it. And it's a very um, unappreciated job, how difficult it is to explain to somebody else who may not learn things the same way you do, um, what it is that, that's going on. Um, so I decided to teach it in the way that I would like it to be taught to me. So every time I learn a board game, I have a series of questions I want answered and they go a little like this. Okay. So step one, who are we and what are we doing? Like, I don't think there's a point in explaining all the minutia of the rules and things. If I can't understand the, the big question, it's like, are we colonizing space? possibly you know are we you know living in a jungle are we trying to build a city what is it because all of those rules that get explained later don't make sense at least to me unless you understand why you're doing them in the first place right then my second question is always how do we win I think this is something that people forget when the, I don't know maybe maybe it's just maybe it's just my husband but it goes right into like the nitty-gritty of everything you do on your turn and I'm like well Yet again, that isn't important unless I know how we win. I'm like, what do we do? Do I need to get, you know, this far on the board? Do I need to get points? Do I need to have uh, got certain achievements? You know, what is it? And usually I want that in very vague terms. I don't need to know specifics early on. I just want to know you, you know, you win by having the longest road. Okay, cool. Um, you don't need to tell me how it is you lay bricks and build a road yet, maybe a little bit. Um, but yeah, so, you know, how, how do I achieve? What is this thing we're trying to get? Specifically in terms of the theme of the game. The next question I always ask is, when will the game end? Because that's another one I think that's really vital because, you know, are we doing this, you know, you need to know right away is, can someone else end the game before I can? Is this a race to a certain point? Um, do we go till these cards run out or whatever it is? I think that helps inform your gameplay from the beginning if you can expect roughly when the game might end. Or if someone goes, there's going to be three phases and then the game ends. Well, you want to know that too. I think that's important. 
The next step um, I ask is, what type of game is this? So by asking that, I mean, what kind of actions are you doing on your turns? So is this a worker placement game? Are we gonna be place placing people out? Is this a card game where I'm gonna to have to draw cards and build a hand? Is this a tableau builder where I put stuff down to play in front of me? So you get a rough idea of what it is to expect on, on your turn, the kind of things you'll be doing. And then I ask the detailed question of, okay, so what, what kind of things can I do on my turn? And then I think you're kind of ready for the minutia of the thing, you know, where you can place this here, but only during this, and this means this, and you know, all those bits where you learn to actually how to play. And I've always found that by having that framework, no matter um, how hard the game is to take in or how much is going on, you feel like you've enough of a grasp of what the game is about that you can pick up all that other stuff on the way. Like I will often start playing a game without knowing on the rules and just be like, I, I will go and try out all the different abilities and just tell me what this does when I get there. So, you know, I'll sit down and be like, okay, what's this actually mean? What's that one do? Um, and test the waters that way. Cause sometimes, Getting all the rules just in your head, I it's it's hard to translate that to what's on the board. Um, I'm a big fan of like, okay, let's just try this out and see what it is. Also, thank you, God, to whoever it is makes the kind of hint sheets that has the turn order things listed on them or the things you can do in a turn. Because I find it's really helpful to like follow along reading that while you're being told the things you can do on your turn. So you can always reference back. You go, oh, I was talking about that bit there. That must go with this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I approach learning a game and I try not to get overloaded right at the start. If I have a rough concept of what everything is up to, good, because we'll figure it out, you know, as we, as we go around, especially the first play of the game, no one's going to play everything perfectly, right? Um, and things like that. So that's, that's how I approach it. Um, and so I taught Calico at the, the weekends, um, and I, I went through my system and it seemed to work. You know, um, some games are easier, obviously, to explain than others. Um, and of course, you don't want to do an absolutely massive kind of rules teach and then, you know, no one feels like playing the game at the end of it either. Um, so yeah, that's how I, that's how, that's how I do it. Um, I wonder how the rest of you approach it. I'm quite systematic because I do play a lot of board games and I need to get this information into me as quickly as possible. Um, I really hope you guys can't hear the drilling outside. Me is pretty loud. I've no idea how good my mic is at picking this stuff up, but um, there we go. We'll see if they'll stop soon. <laughs> Probably not. You're gonna have to listen well. We're almost at the end of the video. You can live with a little bit of drilling. Um, so yeah, so that's how I teach games. I'd love to hear how you teach yours. Um, what do you think of my method? Would you think it, it would help to hear things in that order? It is a rather esoteric message, method. It's very much, I know it suits me. I'd like to think it might suit other people too, but you never really know. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's been the, the fun stuff of teaching a game. Um, apart from that, things are quiet around here, you might have noticed. Um, I've had very kind of few videos coming out at the minute and that's entirely purposeful because it's hard to look at my computer right now. So I'm really proud of myself for getting here and making this video today. I almost didn't because I had so few games to talk about. It felt weird kind of coming to you with nothing, um, but that's how it is. Um, <laughs> um, in other interesting news, I have canceled my Patreon. Um, yeah, um, I, I don't know. It's, I got a nice reaction to it, which was good. But for me, like, there's this big pressure that when you start making kind of content or things like that, that you should suddenly become like your own business, that this could be your job, that maybe you could make money out of this. Um, and I think getting wrapped up in that idea for me personally was just not a very healthy one. Um, because you know what, that's, that's probably not going to happen, <laughs> you know, but putting the stresses on yourself like that, um, I think takes some of the fun out of just, you know, playing games and telling you about them. Um, because I was thinking about why I set up this channel in the first place and it really was just, I needed to do something um, to prove I was, I was still here, that I was still a person, that I could still do something. It came along at a really kind of hard point in my life. Um, and 
I want to folk I wanted to focus on the the fun part of making these things I don't want to feel like I have to have something out every week or I have to present something to somebody and while none of my patreon people were like that at all I still felt that kind of pressure myself I think when you mingle money and hobbies things things change right it's not the same anymore um so yeah I got rid of that um and I'm just I'm working on doing what I can when I feel like what I can so Hence why we're here with this video. Um, and I, I think I think it was a good idea. I think I think I'll be okay. Um, yeah, I I do. I think it was good for me. I don't think that's good for everybody else, but I've decided to just take this social media thing on my own merit, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna be popular or whatever it is, but I I don't really care. I think as long as somebody finds use in what I do, then we're good, right? Because you know, that's that's why I'm making this fun. But some really loud drilling lads. <sighs> <laughs> So yeah, um, so yeah, then anything else happening this month? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of War Machine happening in my house. I keep meaning to put it in the Games Play section, but then I'm afraid I'll scare off the board gamers if I put it there. Um, but anyway, I'll put it here. For anybody who plays War Machine or who might be interested in it, it is a very cool miniature war game. Um, I would say it's got a lot of rules. It might take a bit of learning, but if you've played a war game before, it should be okay. It's got a really cool aesthetic, lots of miniatures, and I've been getting lots of miniatures and painting them. We found a really, really good sale. So now the house is full of unassembled miniatures. It's basically our Christmas present is already here. Whoops, and I've been having fun um, painting those up and messing around with those, including trying to paint a speedboat. Hmm, yeah, if you're curious about that, you can uh, ask in the comments below. <laughs> I don't think anyone will care. But um, yeah, otherwise, I'm keeping the world small. Finally getting back into board games a little bit, so hopefully next month it will be more interesting. And yeah, and I'll be back with more videos soon. So yeah, keeping this short and sweet, right? I never manage it. All right, so thank you for watching. Um, if you like what I do, you should like or subscribe to the channel because yeah, that's really good for everybody all around and you'll get notifications about my latest videos. And I'll see you again soon for another um, good old game related video. Yeah, that. All right, take care everybody, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.